name is Kim McQuarrie, and I'm the Director of Community Programming and Co-Director of the Innovation Labs here at the Delhi Museum. We're happy to welcome you back for this new episode of our Follow the Tangent podcast. In this bi-monthly podcast, we delve into the world of the art archives and focus on the examination of different archive artifacts, showing how it can offer us a behind the scenes glimpse of art history. In this episode, we're going to be exploring some of the connections that Dali had with major surrealists, specifically writers, and touch on his own role as an author with Dr. William Jeffett, our Dali Museum curator. Welcome to the podcast, William. Oh, thank you for inviting me. Happy to be here. Excellent. Now, the root of everything that we're going to discuss today is really the Surrealist movement. So can you tell us a little bit about what Dali's role was in the Surrealist movement? Well, Dali uh, sort of entered the Surrealist movement in the spring of 1929, shortly after he arrived in Paris uh, to live. The first time he moved there to live, he had visited before, but really hadn't been there very much. Um, and he remained very engaged with the Surrealist movement until 1939, when he had a kind of big falling out with him. Uh, and through the 30s, he, he had a very strong relationship with, uh, with the Surrealist movement, which was both a literary and an artistic movement, primarily a literary movement. He had his ups and downs, but throughout that period, he was deeply engaged in Surrealism um, and uh, considered one of its most uh, prominent and public figures. Now, obviously, we primarily know Dali um, through his painting, but how did he interact with um, the many other figures of the Surrealist movement, most of whom were writers? Well, in the way the movement was primarily a literary movement, uh, especially centered on poetry and uh, a kind of narrative writing that was very unusual, but that, that had a lot to do with poetry. Um, so while we now probably in some ways remember many of the artists, whether it's Dali, Miro, um, André Masson, and others as very, very famous figures. Um, uh, the, the writers at the time were the sort of key players, and, and there were many of them, uh, most prominently uh, André Breton, who was sort of invented the idea more or less and, and kind of named the movement in 1924. Mm -hmm. uh, and there were many others like Paul Eluard and today I'll, I'll introduce you to uh, some of the other ones as, as well. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, that's excellent. So now we're thinking about some of these writers that he had these relationships um, with. What are some of the exemplars um, that we have of the work that he did with them? Well, um, f uh, because uh, writing was so important, um, and one of the questions that Surrealism was preoccupied with was the relation of word and image. This mm -hmm. led artists and writers to collaborate with each other um, and uh, so sometimes, as in the case of Dali, uh, his writer friends would um, uh, ask him if he would do something visual to accompany their poetry. Um, also, Surrealism was a, a quite sort of adventuresome uh, and experimental movement in many ways. It wasn't sort of um, so interested in the question of formal experimentation, but also, but a kind of experimentation that would explore uh, the inner world uh, of the writer and the relation between the interior and the exterior world, Freud having been uh, a, a key sort of influence mm -hmm. uh, at the turn of the century, led people to wonder about the parts of the mind that are, were not so known to reason and so Surrealism's project from a literary and an artistic point of view was to explore um, both the known and the unknown realms of human experience. And that's really part of the, the project uh, of the poetry. So also the movement created some of the finest works of art and of literature of the 20th uh, century. So there were a number of other writers that, um, that um, were associated with the movement. Uh, Tristan Zara, who had been involved with what, what had been called the Dada movement prior to Surrealism, which was a kind of um, nihilistic anti-art movement um, driven by the uncertainty of the First World War and the sort of tumult of that period and really rejecting a lot of values. But he, he comes back into Surrealism uh, 
later on, um, Georges Ugnet, um, uh, and uh, so on and so forth. And like I said, these are often fairly experimental approaches to poetry. One book we're going to look at in a few minutes is, uh, is written by two writers. It's written by Andre Breton and Paul Eluard. Mm -hmm. um, and so uh, that's uh, quite uh, interesting uh, to kind of go beyond the idea that uh, poetry is just a, an expression of a single subjectivity, but mm -hmm. maybe is something broader than that. Yeah, and I know that we're lucky enough to have um, some of these manuscripts in our collection that have Dali's um, frontispieces um, and or illustrations of some of these texts. Um, which ones do you have to share with us today? Well, they, um, uh, Dali uh, was fascinated with etchings and uh, engraving and other printing techniques. And as an accomplished artist, he was able to uh, um, bring to bear his own pictorial language in relationship to some of these uh, um, ideas of poetry that were in the air at the time. So I'd like to start with uh, uh, the one I just mentioned, uh, the uh, collaboration in 1930 between um, Paul Eluard and, um, and André Breton. Now Eluard uh, is another figure that goes back to the beginning, the early days of surrealism and even the period of Dada before that. Um, and also he had been married to Gala, the woman that Dali ends up uh, uh, marrying and that he met in 1929 uh, when Eluard and, um, and Gala visited Dali in Spain following uh, his, his, the months he had spent in Paris prior to that. Um, and Gala had a lot of connections also to surrealism um, and she becomes a focus for Dali. Anyway, I'll, I'll first I'll show you um, uh, this uh, this wonderful um, wonderful book, and uh, it's um, uh, etchings, which are not necessarily illustrations of the text. So th th this is very much the artist's kind of interpretation. Um, uh, and they stand as a kind of, as independent works of art. This one actually has a drawing by Dali and a dedication um, to the first owner of the book. And the uh, extraordinary etching, um, which is in some ways quite erotic in its subject matter, um, mm -hmm. the surrealists were interested in exploring through these media um, very, um, adventuresome ideas of, of human love. And, uh, and Dali was also doing that in a sort of visual way. Um, so uh, much of the movement was very provocative and transgressive and Dali followed step with the uh, uh, development of the uh, poets. Yeah, and maybe more provocative too, because the book is entitled um, Immaculate Conception. And yes, they weren't uh, um, afraid of um, challenging um, received wisdom about um, uh, traditional values uh, mm -hmm. at all. So, Yeah, that's interesting. Now, uh, there's a personal connection, uh, just not to pause too long there, but there is a personal connection that maybe not everyone in the audience knows um, between uh, Dully and Paul Eluard. Um, could you just elaborate on that a little bit? Well, I mean, uh, they were very close friends and they remained very close friends. And uh, as I said a moment ago, Eluard would, had been married to Gala, who becomes Dolly's wife. And they, the minute she meets him, they, they kind of decide to live together when they visit Dolly down in Spain in the summer of uh, 1929. Uh, she, Paul Eluard goes back um, with his daughter, um, and uh, Gala stays in Spain with Dolly, and that was they never separated after that and stayed together the rest of their lives. But um, Eluard didn't have any sort of enmity towards Gala, and they remained incredibly close friends and maintained a very um, uh, intimate uh, correspondence over the over the years. And um, and also Eduard was one of Dolly's biggest um, supporters. Um, there were people who were less enamored of Dolly at moments of tension within surrealism going into the mid thirties. Uh, and there were many people who defended Dolly and uh, Eluard was one of them. Mm 
Um, and another was uh, Tristan Zara, the uh, former Dadaist I mentioned earlier. And um, at a time when Dali was really on the verge of potentially falling out with Breton and various other members of the group like Benjamin Perret, um, Zara and Eduard um, came to his defense, um, which is very interesting. Um, um, Zara also, um, as, as with eventually Eduard, uh, was a very committed figure of the political left, as were many of the surrealists, and he had uh, time for, for Dali. Mm -hmm. So the, the next example I want to show you is, um, is, uh, uh, is Breton. Um, this is 1932. Uh, it's the frontispiece for the book um, Le Revolver à Chevau Blanc, which um, in English would be something like the revolver with uh, white hair. Um, very kind of irrational uh, title, but this shows Dolly's proximity to Breton. We should never forget that they were extremely close. Mm -hmm. So when people fall out, it's often because they've had uh, some sort of uh, relationship that's very positive. And, um, and in this case, it was a positive intellectual artistic uh, respect. Uh, and uh, sometimes that led very strong personalities to fall out with each other. Mm -hmm. um, another figure of interest is Georges Hugnet, who also had an interest in, in Dada. And uh, he wrote this volume of poems called Onan, for which Dali did the frontispiece. 1934, and um, the um, uh, in this case, the title of the book and the uh, nature of the image that Dolly created for it do have a relationship, maybe more uh, tightly than some of the other uh, examples we're looking at today. So Onan refers to Onanism, which is a reference to masturbation, and Dolly explains in this very kind of squiggly and erratic plate, uh, the method of how he made it, or he claimed to have made it uh, in the little text at the bottom of the plate, that um, he was drawing with his left hand while he was masturbating with his right hand, and that the marks on the plate are the byproduct of this little performance that he had created. Um, whether this is true or not, is hard to, to tell, uh, mm -hmm. but it makes a nice story, and it certainly would have been another example of the surrealist being extremely provocative and shocking. Yeah, and this falls in with something that um, we've talked about before with um, our librarian, um, Shana. And she has talked about the fact that, you know, this was such a part of his identity um, that, you know, one of his alter egos was this great masturbator figure. Yes, yeah, so which comes along uh, right around the same time. Mm -hmm. And it forms part of this sort of Freudian curiosity about um, exploring human sexuality, the, in, the unknown, the known, the interior, the exterior, and, and sort of breaking barriers between the idea of the personal and the public and so on. Mm -hmm. So I mentioned also Tristan Zara. Um, this is uh, his book, Grand Issue, published uh, in Paris in 1935, and um, for which Dali also did uh, the frontispiece. And in this case, it's a kind of um, Dali-esque landscape. We're into the mature period of Dali's uh, surrealism in terms of his painting at the time. And it's very densely filled with uh, images that you find elsewhere in his paintings and drawings. Um, uh, Grana Issue is a very long poem, which is um, uh, written in a sort of prose um, that, that um, has a tone both extremely poetic and is rife with sociological jargon. Mm -hmm. um, it's a very, very odd book. Um, sections of it were published in one of the Surrealist Reviews before the book came out, so a couple of years ahead of that, um, in the Surrealist Magazine, the Surrealism, service de la Revolution, Surrealism at the Service of the Revolution. Tsar was a figure who gravitated towards the Communist Party, event, eventually separates himself from Surrealism and, and, and becomes a lifelong communist later in, uh, in his life. Um, 
but, but uh, it, it, it is an extraordinary uh, piece of writing and, um, and, and Dolly's etching for it is equally um, uh, as extraordinary and also disturbing. Um, so um, uh, this is another maybe less intuitive um, connection that Dolly had to, um, to the surrealist movement in a period when Zara and Zara had come back into the movement for about three or four years. Um, and then he separates again himself. It must be said many of these personalities were very, very big egos and that led them often to have different um, ruptures for different reasons uh, uh, and tensions amongst each other. But uh, maybe what's interesting is that so many uh, giant sort of um, writers and artists were attracted to have very close relationships amongst each other mm -hmm. and not just be isolated um, atomistic figures. So uh, they felt the need for some kind of collective activity uh, and um, uh, compromise and commitment, uh, and, and that's uh, uh, intriguing. I uh, want to come back to Paul Eduard, and as I said before, uh, Paul Eduard had a long uh, relationship with Dali, um, and um, this is a volume of poetry called Cor Naturel, uh, Natural Course, um, published in Paris in 1938. This is a little bit lighter than some of the other books we've been looking at. Um, uh, like Zara, Eliard was a man of the left, um, and uh, in this volume of poetry, there, there are a couple of poems that um, draw uh, one's attention, uh, in particular a famous poem called The Victory of Guernica, which is a poem of great hope in the face of um, the oblique events of the bombing of the city of Guernica, in uh, um, spring, in the spring of, of 1937 uh, in, in Spain, uh, which, which really, really was uh, you know, one of the sort of worst early uh, atrocities of the, of the Spanish Civil War. And another poem called November 1936, um, which um, is a poem sparked by the bombings of Madrid in um, 1936 by the um, by the uh, military um, attempting to overthrow the Republican government. Those bombs fell off in the, uh, often in the center of Madrid and even uh, some of them um, affected the Prado, um, which shortly thereafter decided to evacuate the entire contents of the museum and eventually they went out of Spain to Geneva where they stayed in Switzerland for the rest of the um, Civil War and were only returned at the conclusion of the uh, conflict. Um, so uh, it's, it's a, a book, book that's, that's close in spirit in many ways to Picasso, mm -hmm. uh, who had painted the great painting Guernica the year before the volume of poetry was published. Um, and um, uh, which is another symbol of hope in one way or another. And Eliard was just a, a tremendously close friend of, um, of, of Picasso's. Um, it's often thought, with some uh, good reason, uh, that Dali and Picasso uh, didn't have a very, very uh, close relationship, and there was certainly rivalry. Um, and uh, the idea that they were sort of relatively remote from each other so it's very interesting that this volume of poetry doesn't have a frontispiece by Picasso in it, but it has a frontispiece by Dali in it, um, uh, which is also an image that seems to evoke uh, some idea of the horror of war. It's almost a kind of embodiment of that uh, idea. It's not a very well-known book, and this image is not fantastically well-known. Uh, but it's an intriguing thing and um, a, 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 a very interesting. Um, I think it's also interesting that in the archives of the Dali Museum, we hold so many uh, materials of this kind of nature because uh, it, it's become incredibly difficult to locate these things and uh, it, it, almost impossible to acquire them. So it's a great privilege that we have these holdings and that we'd like to share them uh, a little bit with the public and with you today. Um, yeah, and it's, I mean, obviously Dali had all of these really fascinating and close relationships um, with the Stilus writers, Breton, also um, Eluard and Zara, um, as you were saying. And 
in addition to these illustrations that he's doing for um, the writer's works that, you know, to a greater or lesser extent are, you know, supporting or being juxtaposed with their themes, he was also himself um, writing at the same time. And that's not something that we often think of when we think of Dali, um, of him as a writer, but what kinds of writing um, did Dali do? Well, he, he was a fairly varied writer um, and he, early on in, in the 1930s, um, from 1929 into the mid thirties, he wrote quite a lot of poetry. Mm -hmm. um, and it was also published in contexts very similar to the other surrealist writers. So Dali, so Dali was, was very, very, very active, active um, as a surrealist poet in a way. Um, he also wrote another kind of text that was sort of critical, critical theoretical text about art. Mm -hmm. um, and that was published sometimes in the various surrealist magazines um, from La Revolution Surrealiste to Surrealism au service de la Revolution uh, and others uh, such as the review called Minotaur, which refers to the mythical creature Minotaur mm -hmm. um, in the, the mid-1930s. So he, he was very visible as a writer uh, uh, along different lines. Later on, of course, he wrote a novel and he wrote an autobiography and um, various other kinds of texts, but he, he was pretty active as a writer throughout his life. Um, but one of his the first uh, surrealist poems he wrote in Paris was this one called La Femme Visible, The Visible Woman, published by uh, Edition Surrealiste, at least the surrealist publishing house, short lived but nevertheless important. Um, that that in 1930, 1930, so only a few months, a uh, year after he's, he comes to Paris. And um, in La Femme Visible refers to Gala, Dali's wife, who photographically appears on the frontispiece of the book. And the book has, has a double, double frontispiece, piece, um, as well uh, as the, the photograph it has uh, an etching facing the title page, very erotic. And the poem itself is erotic, as are some of these early lengthy poems that Dali wrote, so like um, uh, L'amour et la mémoire, uh, um, Love and Memory, which is another poem, more or less, let's say, dedicated uh, to uh, Gala. Um, and uh, so, uh, these poems uh, certainly attracted quite a lot of attention as the, and these publications did and, uh, along the same lines as some of the other uh, quite uh, interesting surrealist publications, uh, even including the ones we've been looking at today, which were very, very provocative and shocking. Uh, they were probably destined to a relatively small audience, uh, but there's always been um, uh, quite a lot of uh, um, interest and um, in collecting and in fascination with, with this nexus of writers and artists. Uh, and that continues today. There's an enormous interest uh, uh, in um, these kind of uh, objects, um, which have become increasingly rare due to that sort of uh, interest. But while it's enormous, it's, um, it's probably a, a, a fairly small, uh, group of people, but with, with great, great deals of enthusiasm. Great deals of enthusiasm. Um, um, and uh, and uh, so again, so again we're, we're very privileged, privileged uh, to uh, have these uh, uh, wonderful objects uh, that are increasingly extremely rare and to be able to share them uh, with you today. Yeah, that's, I mean, those are some amazing pieces. Um, and could you just offer us a final thought? Um, I think what you said at the beginning um, of our talk it really made me um, start thinking and view some of these objects uh, a little bit differently. And that is, you mentioned this relationship between word and image. 
And I was wondering if you might just revisit that a final word of, you know, Delhi specifically or the surrealists more in general of that relationship between. Um, yeah, it's, it's an ongoing concern in surrealism. Um, and the surrealist artists were trying to create things like visual metaphor in the way they deployed images within painting or in other media, other visual media they explored. And also a, a surrealist poetry is incredibly visual in the references it makes. Um, it summons up images. Um, so it, 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 it's, um, it's not a kind of poetry that's about um, the um, necessarily about the sort of formal structure of language uh, that may or may not be present in some instances, but, um, but it's, it's really driven by a kind of um, imagistic uh, a notion and uh, is, pushes metaphor to the extreme uh, and also, you know, uh, creates irrational images that, it's, that, that, that make no uh, rational sense and that challenge some of our kind of assumptions. And yet uh, through images, it's possible to do that. Uh, so uh, there is a kind of ongoing uh, dimension of that. And uh, one way it played out is in terms of this type of activity um, but it's there in the poetry and in the painting. Well, I really want to thank you for offering us this fascinating glimpse into another side of Delhi's work and these relationships that he had um, with the other Surrealist writers. Thank you so much for joining us today. You're welcome. Thank you. It's a pleasure. And I welcome our audience to join us next time. We'll be back on April 22nd with the next Follow the Tangent podcast with our curatorial assistant, Kelsey Halbeck. And I will see you then. Bye-bye.